Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to uh, the seminar that I get to present today. It's called The Church of YouTube, How Social Media is Changing the Way That We Do Missions. And if we haven't had the privilege of meeting yet, my name is Justin, and on YouTube, I run a channel called That Christian Vlogger. Um, the way that I describe the work that I do is I consider myself a digital missionary. I have some friends that are actually in uh, Cambodia right now serving as missionaries going overseas and spreading the gospel over there. And I believe that's a, a very important work and a very valuable work. But I also think that if we're wanting to reach specifically young people in the Western world, which is, in my opinion, actually one of the hardest groups of people to reach, uh, we see the, the, the church growing on all like third world uh, countries on, in many different continents. But when it comes to um, the developed worlds in, in Europe, in in, in America, things like that, we see that young people at a very alarming rate are disengaging from faith. And I believe that if we are wanting to be very successful in passing uh, our faith on to the generations to come, then we really need to meet people where they're at. And so this is kind of this whole concept of digital missions that I really have devoted my entire life to. Uh, I'm a full-time YouTuber uh, right, creating content uh, to help people get closer to God. So I'm really excited to be able to share this kind of uh, th this, this thought with you guys here today. You're probably going to hear it said a lot in today's conference that we are facing the largest communication shift in the last 500 years. Uh, 500 years ago, the Gutenberg Press was invented. And even though, you know, as a Chinese uh, person, I, I, I would like to say that the Chinese did happen to have a printing press uh, many, many, many years before uh, Gutenberg, but we'll give them credit for it. We'll say that this is the largest communication shift in the last 500 years. And uh, with the advent of social media, so many things are changing uh, from the way that we date and the way that we the, uh, we learn and communicate and share, we buy and even sell things. All this is changing. And I believe it has also changed the way that many young people uh, engage with their faith and the way that they worship. And I think it should impact the way that we do ministry. And so when it comes to reaching young people, I think about the average day of a millennial. I'm 28 years old, and so I definitely fall under this category. I've run these numbers by some of my friends, and as astonishing as it might sound, this is fairly accurate. Um, there's a study done by the Wall Street Journal that estimates the 24 hours that are given in a day, and they, they basically do uh, a study as to how much time young people spend when it comes to social media and spending time uh, behind a screen in one way, shape, or form. They found this, that uh, for three hours and 34 minutes in a day, they're using the internet. Social media is used three hours and 12 minutes a day. Uh, they watch live television for two hours and 19 minutes a day. They play video games for about an hour and 47 minutes a day. Uh, watching TV on demand like Netflix, Hulu, things along those lines for an hour and 47 minutes. Uh, they watch movies for about an hour and 15 minutes every single day. Uh, they'll listen to radios or podcasts for about an hour and 15, and they'll end up texting or emailing for a little over an hour and four minutes, which gives us about an hour talking about brands and products and doing online shopping and things along those lines. In other words, if you do the math, in a given day, the average millennial is spending over 18 hours a day behind a screen. Now, this doesn't mean that they are, uh, you know, doing all these dedicated at one point in time. It's, it's likely that while they're cooking dinner, they're watching Netflix. And as they're driving to school or commuting to work, they're listening to a podcast. And even as they're sitting in a lecture or at church, they're probably on their phone texting someone or on Twitter or Instagram. In fact, I remember not too long ago, I was actually giving this exact seminar uh, in, in, at, a, at a Bible college in Michigan. And as I'm up there in the front, I'm able to look over the audience and see what everyone is doing and there was one individual who literally had headphones in his ear and I could see that this person was FaceTiming in the middle of a worship service and that might be a little bit excessive but the point stands that young people are using technology far more than than is probably healthy uh, but they're, they're certainly doing a, a lot and if we are serious about wanting to take our message and to take the gospel to young people and to spread the message to to people that you know might really not ever go to a church in their entire life. I think social media missions, digital missions, is something that is super, super important, something that we really need to, as a church, capital C, 
be devoting tons of resources and energy and personnel to. And that's why it's something that I'm very, um, I feel very privileged to commit my entire life to and, and really just give my very best uh, as, as a digital missionary. So I wanna ask us the question today as we're talking about how social media has changed the way that we do missions. I want to ask the broader question, how has modern technology changed society today? You know, you don't have to look very far to find a ways that technology has changed many, many different industries. For example, to get to start off, how many of you guys remember if you wanted to watch a movie and you're gonna have a movie night with your friends, you needed to go to a place like Blockbuster. Uh, Blockbuster, you'd go and rent your movies for a dollar or something along those lines. And, and, and we see now with technology, Blockbuster has basically gone extinct. Uh, we, we see that people are turning into Netflix or Hulu, even YouTube, uh, things along those lines. And in fact, movie attendance, at, like the actual cinemas, uh, is at a 25 year low, at least in the United States and in Canada. Um, and you know, there's a lot of debate as to whether movie pass, which is something that's relatively new, is gonna help or to hurt that case. But the, the point is, is that technology has changed this industry. How many of you guys remember when you wanted to listen to a song or listen to music, you literally had to, uh, to tune into one of these Walkman or CD player or something along those lines. Nowadays we have iTunes, we have Spotify, we have uh, podcasts, things along those lines. And so we see technology changing even the music industry. It used to be that if you wanted to learn something new and you wanted to study or research something out for a paper, or whatever the case is, or you just had a curiosity about a certain random fact in life, you had to go to the library and look up in this thing called the Dewey Decimal System. I still remember in elementary school learning how to use this, but nowadays it's extinct. We just simply use Google whenever we have a questions. Whenever we have to catch a ride, we use Uber or Lyft, whereas we used to have to hail a taxi. And something that I thought was kind of interesting, you guys remember when you wanted to buy a toy or get a gift for a birthday party, many times we'd go to a store like Toys R Us. And nowadays, this store has actually gone bankrupt. It's closed down. And what's interesting about Toys R Us is that they literally signed the check to the company that put them out of business. They didn't want to adapt to the times and rather than trying to uh, figure out the online delivery and fulfillment of their toys, they actually hired Amazon, which is the company that ended up putting them out of business to, 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 to do all their fulfillment. And so it's kind of crazy. Every one of these industries has changed. And it used to be when it came to the areas of spirituality and religion and the Bible in particular, when you had a question, you would approach a pastor, you would approach a teacher, you would approach some type of an adult mentor figure in your life. And um, this is just not the way that young people do it. We're going to talk more about this, but this is not the way that young people engage with their faith. And what's interesting is the needs for these things have not changed. It's simply the way that people go about fulfilling these needs, that is what has changed in the last couple of years. And what I think is interesting, like these, these, these are all, all these changes that before are just changes that have happened in the last, say, 20 years. I remember every single one of the befores, and I remember even what it is like today. And, and as we see, what doesn't change in, in whatever industry it is, whatever doesn't adapt to the times, whatever doesn't change, ends up going extinct. And I'm afraid that if we as a church don't realize uh, the, the way that times are changing, that this could actually happen when it comes to faith and church and, and reaching our young people today. Uh, a pastor, Kerry Newhoff, based out of Toronto, Canada, says this, too many churches are perfectly equipped to reach a world that no longer exists. And I think that this is so like spot on. So many churches are perfectly equipped to reach a world that no longer exists. The, the, the entire premise of church is still based off getting people to come to a physical location on a given hour during the week. And that's great for a lot of people. And many people are blessed by that model. But there are for many, many, many people that that model of what church is, it, it doesn't work. And I think that this is really where the advantages of social media and YouTube in particular really come to play because you can have church not just on a building down the street on the corner, but church can be in your home. Church can be in your hand every single minute of the day. And so I'm really excited to kind of dive deeper into this. Um, one of the major things that I believe is that while the world has evolved, while technology has evolved, 
humanity, we have not evolved. Fundamentally, I believe that we are the same exact people who have the same questions and need the same answers and we have the same desires as the people that have come many generations uh, in the past before us. You talk to any young person, talk to any millennial, and, and the types of things that they're really worried about, the kinds of things they spend their time focused on are things about origin and meaning and morality and destiny. Every young person that I've ever met before wants to use their skills and their gifts to serve a larger purpose. So young people today in particular are not okay with just the clock in, clock out mentality. They want to do something broader, something bigger, something with deep meaning and purpose. They want to be a part of relieving the suffering that's out there in the world. And, 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 and the, the reality is so many young people just don't know how to do that. We see this desire played out in social justice warriors. We see this played out in how, how young people nowadays are, are so quick to, 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 to support uh, immigrants or to, to basically call out the evils of human trafficking and things like that. Many young people, they want to make a difference, but aren't always sure how to go about doing it. There's this confidence that they have in, in that I know that I can change the world, but not really having the mentorship and the leadership and the community uh, that really will help direct and guide them as they go throughout this process. And, and I think this is really why it's so important for you and I to take the charge of, of, of spreading the gospel so serious that we're willing to go where young people are today. And that is primarily online when it comes to social media and things like that. Most young people today, when they have questions about life, they turn to social media, to turn to technology. And, and you're no stranger to this. I'm sure that you do this as well. When you want to learn how to tie a tie for the very first time, before you would talk to your parent or you talk to someone you know that that you would look up to nowadays you just you google it you look on youtube if you want to know how to change a tire or to install an air conditioning unit or if you want to learn how to do any number of things you simply go online and you google the question and you find answers on youtube or google and what we're finding today is that this is exactly what young people are doing when they have deep, meaningful questions about spirituality, about religion, and about faith in general. I'll give you an example. These are the following questions are questions that are asked uh, over a hundred thousand times every single month on Google and or YouTube. To start off, is God real? This is literally a question that young people are typing into Google or YouTube over 100,000 times a month. People are searching 100,000 times a month for Bible study tools. They're asking questions like what happens after death. They're trying to get information on things like Bible prophecy and what is faith. By and large, we see this trend over and over and over again. Young people are turning to technology. They're turning to social media for answers. But if the church is so, is so uh, what's the word I'm looking for, tunnel visioned on the weekend service, and the only efforts that we have are trying to get, young, uh, to get strangers to come to our building, and anyone who doesn't come to our building, we're not concerned in ministering to them, we're going to miss out on so many people who never show up to church. And so we really, I believe, as a church, need to consider digital ministry. And it makes sense because today we have an opportunity that has never been afforded to anyone who's come before in the history of the world. For the first time in the history of the world, we have the opportunity to communicate with literally the entire world through the power of social media. With just a few clicks of a button, you can tweet out to billions of people, theoretically. Uh, it used to be that if you wanted to communicate a message, you literally had to go down and write it down by hand into a book. Or you had to actually get on a horse and, and travel across the country to get on a boat in order to reach someone with a message that you believe. And nowadays, we can literally be doing this from our living room. We could literally be doing this as we're commuting from a car. And so the question that I want to ask us is, what are we as a church doing about it? In your local church, do you have a digital missions branch of your church? Do you have a social media pastor? Do you have someone who's focused on how can I take this message out there into the world to where people are actually at? And this is the example that we saw in Jesus. Jesus went where people were. And if we want to be successful in ministry, I think we would do very well to emulate Jesus's model, going where people are and ministering to them there. And so this is, again, why I'm very excited to be able to share this concept with you, because this is something I believe in so, so very much. This is something I've committed uh, my, my whole being to in this moment, that the, the, the digital missions is something that I believe God really is wanting to work towards. And, and, and so I want to kind of share a brief uh 
capsule of my story as to why I've come to this moment and kind of how I made that decision. Um, you know, when I first graduated from high school, the summer after high school, I had the opportunity to get involved with a youth and young adult ministry. It's a little archaic. We would literally go door to door to door, knocking on doors for like eight to 10 hours a day, knocking on doors, asking people if they wanted to get Christian literature, if they wanted to get prayer, if they wanted Bible studies and invite them to church and, and to do this type of door-to-door -door ministry. And so I think in one summer I had knocked on like like 10,000 doors, spoken to thousands of people. And, and I really thought it was worth the time because why? Because the message was so valuable. I believe that the message that, that we find in the scriptures is life-changing. It changed my life. It, it really gave me a new perspective on life. And so I was willing to go and, and, and literally blood, sweat, and tears and to do everything that I possibly could in order to share that message with people who may have never heard it before. So I did that for several years. I actually did that for like 10 years of ministry. Um, and then what did I do next? My ne the next evolution, I was called to do more preaching and teaching as, 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 a, as an evangelist and a Bible teacher uh, across churches across the country. And I was able to speak to dozens of people at a time or hundreds of people in other cases and thousands at certain other cases, preaching the same message that I would take door to door to door. Why? Because the message mattered. If it was worth sharing it with one person, it was worth sharing it with an entire congregation. And then recently I had an opportunity to go to Philadelphia where they called me to be a teacher and literally to teach at a Bible college. And what I was doing with, with, with people one-on-one, -on -one, door by door, or speaking to dozens or hundreds or thousands of people, I now have the opportunity to invest in young leaders who would then go and, and spread that message even further than I ever could. I could multiply my efforts by teaching young people what I was doing myself. And so every step along the way, the reason why I was into this line of work is because I believed in the message. And I started to realize something because my class was really, really small. I had 11 students in my class, tiny little class. And I would put hours and hours and hours of time and research and study and preparation into these lessons plans, much like what many of you guys are doing with your churches and your ministries, your Bible studies. You put a lot of time and energy preparing this material, but it's worth it because the message makes a difference in those people's lives. And then I started to think, what if I could not just reach one or two or even dozens or hundreds or thousands, but what if I could reach tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, potentially even millions of people? What would it look like if God took the same message that he was, he was speaking through me in a local level and was able to broadcast that across the world? What would that look like? And it was this kind of a vision, this idea that got planted in my mind. I was like, oh, all right. I'm gonna give this a shot. And so I decided to, I grabbed my first camera. Uh, I had zero experience with a camera, zero classes or courses in graphic design or editing or any of these kind of com like complete novice. I grabbed the camera, picked it up and decided to just give it a shot. And this was about two, two years ago. And today my channel has a little over 60,000 subscribers. I'm able to speak to anywhere between 100 to 200,000 young people every single month. My channel has, has already reached over 2 million views. And what's interesting about the audience that, I, that is kind of self-selected around my content is that 77% of them are under the age of 34. They're millennials, they're Gen Zs, they're very young people that I believe that God has called me to, 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 to reach. And it was, it's so cool to see how young people are actually responding to these messages. I'm gonna to get to some of the stories in just a little bit. And I really want to, I, I guess I wanna kind of back up. Again, the reason why I'm doing this is because of the message. The reason why I'm doing YouTube is not because of vanity or because of a, a search for popularity or prestige or anything like that. I'm simply doing it because it is the best return on investment. I could spend 10 hours out there knocking on all of my neighbor's doors asking to pray with them and maybe reach one or two or three or five or 10 people who would say yes. I could go out and preach at, at, you know, at a church or whatever the case is, or I can do the same thing digitally and reach hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And so this is, again, something I'm very, very uh, passionate about. And I believe that this is something that God is calling many of you guys to consider doing so as well. But as you're kind of um, 
making the decision, is this something that I really wanna do? Is this something that's worth doing? There are a lot of questions that people have when it comes to starting a digital missionary. And so today I wanna to go over really briefly five myths about digital ministry that are out there that exist that, that many times cause people to say, you know what, I don't know, is it worth it? Is it really valuable? Does it really make a difference or not? We're gonna go through five myths and kind of some of the responses that I'd like to share with you and stories that I think that really demonstrate that these really are in fact myths. Myth number one, the myth is simply this, no one listens. Many people view social media as a place for toxic arguments uh, about whether it's like gun control or border control or social justice, it's Democrats versus Republicans, it's a place for the liberal left and the radical right to just come and argue and fight and throw mud at each other, calling each other's names and where nothing productive is happening. And that might be actually true for a lot of cases, but it is a myth that no one listens. You know how I know it's a myth that no one listens? Because every parent that sees their kid glued to their phone or a screen for 18 hours a day, every single one of them is concerned about it. Every single one of them will blame social media for all the negative influences on the younger generations. They'll say, oh, kids these days because of social media, because of this and that, they're, they're, they just don't care, they have no manners, they're entitled, this, that, or the other thing. And here's the thing, if no one listened, then how could they blame social media? So clearly people are in fact listening. But the question is, is, is there something worthwhile listening to on social media? And that's where we are supposed to come in. I'll share with the story with you. I got a comment that came from one of my viewers not too long ago. And the story, uh, she, she wrote, wrote in saying, uh, asking a question, Justin, you know, I'm the only Christian in my family and I don't have a car and really there's no churches nearby. What can I do to grow in my faith? And so I responded to this person thinking from my own personal perspective. You know, I live in Portland, Oregon area. I have my own history and my, my journey that I'm going through. And so I assume that this young person, I think she said that she's like 13, 14 years old, was going through the same process as me. And so here's what I said. I said, you know what? Tough love, like stop making excuses. Come on, get, get over yourself. Just do this. Go on Google. Google a church in the nearby area, call them up, find a pastor or an elder, because I guarantee you, if you call them explaining your circumstance and you tell them that you want to go to their church, you want to go to their youth group, but you just don't have a ride, I guarantee you someone out there will pick you up and drive you to church. So I sent off this message feeling really good about myself, feeling, you know, just like, yeah, I really told her like it is, you know. I get this message back from this young girl. And she is so gracious. As you can tell from my response, I'm not like the most patient individual, naturally speaking. But she says, you know, Justin, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't explain myself very clearly. She said, you know, I, I, I live in a Muslim country. I'm literally the only Christian in my family and there are no churches nearby me. And when I read this response, I was absolutely floored because what do you say to that? What do you say in response when you find out that to this young girl across the world in a country that you'll never visit in your life, you know, most likely, what do you do when you realize that you are in a certain respect, the church to her? That God is somehow working through your videos and your ministry to be able to speak to someone who might never in her life be able to have the opportunity to meet another Christian, to go to a church, to, to, to do a Bible study, and yet God is working through you. Clearly, people are listening because this young girl was listening, being impacted by the message, messages that are out there. Here's another story. Many of you guys might recognize this uh, woman, Megan Phelps Roper, uh, for a TED Talk that she's famous for giving. Uh, she is the She's famous because she's the daughter of the Westboro Baptist Church, which is infamous online for some of their hateful and bigoted uh, beliefs and practices. If you're not familiar with the churches, you'll definitely be familiar with the signs. This is her uh, sharing her own message. Uh, you can see on, on the screen here, God is your enemy. These are the people that were going around picketing uh, soldiers' funerals, uh, saying very hateful and mean things like God hates fags and God is your enemy. They're the kinds of people that celebrated when Hurricane Katrina wiped out so many people's livelihoods and killed so many thousands upon thousands. They're saying all this happens because God hates these people. 
And this is the kind of environment that she was brought up in. But in a recent interview on uh, what's called the Joe Rogan podcast, she shares how she had this journey from being in this community, this cult really, to leaving that community, forsaking her family and, and, and forsaking this a hateful version of God that she believed in and eventually leaving it all. She shares her testimony and what had happened was is she was on Twitter trying to spread her propaganda, spread her message of, of you know how God hates people or whatever it was that she was trying to do. And on Twitter, a Jewish man decided that this would be his platform for ministry. Some man out there on social media reached out to her and started to befriend her over Twitter started to ask her questions and to listen, to get to know her a little bit. And over the course of time, planted enough seeds of doubt on, on this picture of God that it caused her to second guess everything that she was taught growing up. And the crazy thing is, is that because of a Jewish man on Twitter, this woman gave up her faith, gave up her family and changed and made a 360 leaving everything behind. And yet people don't listen on social media, right? This is pretty amazing. The sad part is, is that not only did she leave her church community in the Westboro Baptist Church, but she actually ended up leaving Christianity altogether. And as she explains on the podcast, she's actually an agnostic right now. And the reason why I believe that she's an agnostic simply is because there weren't really very many Christian missionaries on social media who are out there trying to reach out to her, trying to connect with her and make a difference in her life. And so I I realize that every single day, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are questioning their core convictions, are questioning their core beliefs, are searching for meaning and purpose and direction, searching to fill that void in their hearts, and they're trying to find an answer. The answer, really, that you and I have found in Christ. And yet, a lot of times, as they're journeying through, as they're going through this process, Unfortunately, the church is silent in the very place that they are listening. And so again, for me, this is why I believe digital missions matters so very much. But probably my favorite story that illustrates that people actually are listening out there on the internet comes from an exchange I had with a fellow YouTuber uh, who goes by the name The Raging Atheist on YouTube. I have this uh, service that allows me uh, to get alerts anytime someone uses my channel name in a video in case they're asking a question or making a response video or something along those lines. And I'm surprised when I find out that the channel that made a video is called The Raging Atheist. And so, of course, I click into the video, not sure what's going to happen. And I'm surprised, or I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, when the entire video is dedicated towards attacking me. Attacking me as a Christian, as a human being, saying that I'm a bigot or I'm hateful, that I'm judgmental, narrow-minded, that I'm unintelligent, like all kinds of like really like terrible things and in very colorful language, of course. Um, And so I'm sitting there thinking like, do I even respond to this? Like, sh- what, what? And if so, what, like, what do I say? Uh, and so I decided to say a prayer and ask God to give me wisdom on what to do. And I decided finally that instead of attacking him, instead of defending myself even, or just like, you know, going on the offense, I would write this instead. I said, hey, Raging Atheist, thank you so much for taking the time to not only watch my video, but to also rebut it. To one of the questions that you put towards me towards the middle of your video, I'm always happy hanging out with people of different worldviews. And if you're ever in the Portland area, hit me up and I'd love to sit down over a cup of coffee, my treat. And so uh, I actually ended up getting a response from him very shortly after that. He says, wow, I'm actually honored you watched my video. You are the, fr- uh, it took the time to respond. You are the first to do so. And I'm thinking in my head, well, yeah, of course I've watched some of the other videos on your channel and you're always like, attacking people but that uh, to the side he says please do have some fun with me i would love to see it i subbed i always love hearing the other side and so here we are i'm subscribed to his channel he subscribed to my channel and we're engaging over the weeks uh, uh, to come in in the comment section of each of our videos uh, a while later i got invited to speak at a conference in oregon for youth and young adults it was maybe three or four hundred young people um and i believe the organizers ended up spending like I want to say like 30 grand for like 400 kids over a weekend, which, you know, kind of blows my mind as far as church budgets are concerned. But, you know, praise the Lord for the ministry that they're doing. And, uh, you know, my wife went to summer camp as a kid and also did the whole camp counselor thing and her life was changed. So I'm not like downplaying it. But the way I approach is like, man, like you put on all this money and efforts to, to minister to three or 400 kids 
And then the same message you bring me out here to share, I video it and I put it online and you can get anywhere from three to four to five times as many people watching that video. Kind of shows you like where we ought to be spending maybe more of our resources and maybe a little bit less. I'm not trying to say we move everything, but at least let's put some energy into digital missions. Anyways, uh, so I upload that video to YouTube and a little while later, I get a response from him doing another video response to that video and this time he's actually going point by point through my entire video responding to some of the things that i had he'd have like 10 seconds of me on the stage talking and then a couple seconds of him responding to what i had said but rather than attacking me and calling me all kinds of negative names and all these different kinds of things like he did in the first video he's actually kind of like meeting me in the middle and he's listening to my message my message was like on the importance of living a life of integrity and really being like you know authentic with your your convictions and if you're going to be a christian like be a christian and live that life like don't be hypocritical don't just say one thing and do another thing and as surprises that might be like he's actually kind of agreeing he's like you know i see his point and i really agree like this is what our young people need to do like this is why he was saying i left the church was because of hypocrites and people who were like living two-faced and so it was kind of cool to see that and then the the best inter interaction i've had with him so far comes on his third video now to give you some context i did a series of videos with this guy this guy is named matthias Matthias lives in Seattle and he's a double master's student in theology and psychology. Now, the interesting thing about Matthias is that he's also a podcast host and his podcast is called Queerology and it's a podcast about the intersection between faith and queer culture. Now, Matthias is a fully affirming and openly gay Christian man. And he believes that, you know, same-sex relationships are in every way, shape, and form blessed by God in the same way that a heterosexual relationship would be. Now, clearly, we came from two different perspectives. I believe one thing, and he believes the exact opposite. But rather than do what most people do on the internet and attack each other and call each other's names and, like, talk over each other and yell and all these different kinds of things, we sat down to have a civil conversation where we sought to learn and to listen and to understand more than anything else. So we did this video series and I thought it was actually pretty good. We, I learned a lot and, I, and, and he learned a lot and I think that we did a good job having the right tone and everything else like that. But then the Raging Atheist makes a video responding to this message. And before I even click on it, I noticed that it was 29 minutes long. And so I'm like, oh goodness, what is gonna happen here? Cause I have no clue what he's gonna say. This is actually how he starts the video itself. What is up my fellow sinners and heathens, my fellow Christians if you're out there, if you're watching Mad Love, this one's for you too. Um, today on The Raging Atheist, I am going to be once again looking at a friend of mine, that Christian vlogger. Um, and he's doing great work on his channel right now. If, if you're not watching his channel, I highly re recommend that you watch his channel. And um, I want to commend him for taking on this subject because I, I kind of challenged him on this. And I, I don't know um, if, if he did this because I challenged him, if he's been planning on doing this for a while. It seems well thought out. Um, and I want to commend him for his bravery on tackling this subject because on his channel, He's really dealing with the problem that Christianity has when it comes to gay people. So the entire video, kind of to my surprise, wasn't at all like speaking any negative things to the content. In fact, the entire video, he was agreeing with me and like actually like giving Matthias and I props for the conversation that we had had. He said, you know what? I didn't even realize this is him speaking that I'm bigoted and I'm hateful and I, I don't give, you know, people of faith and Christians like enough, uh, enough like benefit of the doubt and I'm not even willing to listen to them. He says, I learned a lot from this video that I'm gonna be applying to my life. And I thought that that was so cool that we started off online on YouTube as enemies. He met me in the middle in the second video and in the third video, he's like actually like full on agreeing with everything that I had to say. Now you can imagine how his atheist and agnostic audience ended up responding to this video. They were not happy at all. In fact, if you went through a lot of the comment section, you would realize that a lot of his audience 
were disagreeing with him and attacking me and saying that, you know, all the nasty things that they wanted to say about me and Matthias. And I was like, what do I do? How do I respond? I typed out a couple things and then I realized, no, that doesn't sit well with me. I'll leave it blank. I won't respond. And I'm glad I didn't because a couple hours later, the raging atheist responds to his own subscribers and he's actually defending me. He's saying, no, you're wrong. Like what society needs is more conversations like the one Justin and Matthias had. Like they're doing an awesome work. This is so important. I, I, I value this and I'm behind them and I support them. And he says that you are the problem here in society. You are, you are being so bigoted. You're being so hateful. And it was kind of cool to see this entire 360 turnabouts. And yes, clearly he was listening. Now, of course, I, I, I can't conclude the story, say, therefore, you know, he's now a full believer and he's given his heart to Jesus and all these different kinds of things. But I like to think, you know what? Here's a guy who might never have a healthy interaction with a Christian otherwise. Yeah, I'm sure he doesn't go to church. I'm sure he doesn't spend time in Bible studies or anything else like that. But because of digital missions, I was able to change and shift his perspective of Jesus and to, sh uh, to sh change his perspective of Christians even ever so slightly. And I think that that's actually worth quite a bit. And this leads us to myth number two. You know, a lot of people will say, okay, you know what? Maybe people are in fact listening online, but you know, it doesn't really actually impact their lives. Can people actually change their lives and actually like say get baptized because of digital missions? And the answer to that is actually yes. This is Michael. Michael is one of those students at the school that I was teaching at in Philadelphia. And I got to learn about his story over the months uh, and months and the year that I was able to, to, to disciple him. Uh, at the very beginning, I found out that the reason why he was at that school, the reason why that he decided to give Christianity a shot and to go to the school to learn was because he actually found someone online who was making videos about their faith. Now, Michael grew up in a non-religious home. Uh, you know, for all intents and pra uh, practices, this, this was not a Christian home. It was it might as well have been atheist home. Maybe going to church on like Christmas or Easter, that kind of a thing, but really no religious background. He found videos of a guy making uh, videos on, uh, on Christianity who lived across the country and decided to give it a shot. He enrolled in the school, and after months of me being able to work with him and to journey through uh, a journey through life together with him and to teach him about the Bible, I had the honor, because he actually asked me a few months later, Justin, would you do the honors of baptizing me? And I got to baptize Michael in a river somewhere in Philadelphia, and his life was changed. And it's kind of cool, because the thing that won Michael to the gospel is the thing that Michael has dedicated himself to today. Michael is serving as a digital missionary himself. Here's another comment that I received from someone uh, just around Easter this year. Uh, this is saying, thank you so much for taking the time and effort to create this channel. It's answered a lot of questions for me and it's been lovely to see you and Emily growing together. Emily is uh, my wife who ends up on the channel with me every once in a while. She says, you were a part of the reason I truly built a relationship with God and finally got baptized. This was definitely the biggest paycheck that I've received so far doing YouTube. Uh, and one of the, honestly, one of the biggest gifts that I received is see that this girl named Hope Wythe, who lives in like the UK, someone who I've never met before, she decided to give her life to the Lord in part because of the mission that God was carrying out through my YouTube channel. So yes, people listen and people's lives are impacted and they'll even make decisions to follow Jesus because of something that happens online. Myth number three, it's only for young people. This is just false. Generation X, uh, a, a study according to the New York Times says that Generation X are more addicted to social media than millennials. In fact, uh, out of uh, Australia, a Griffith University socio-technology expert named uh, Dr. David Tuffley says that uh, people who are over the age of 75 and older, this is where they're seeing the steepest rise in social media usage. In fact, over 75% of senior citizens use social media every single day. And this makes sense when you think about this. You know, many of these this demographic are shut-ins, they're sick, they're widowers, they're widowers, their family has moved out of the area. And so they're disconnected from their community, they're disconnected from their church. And as a result, they're using social media to kind of su uh, supplement what, what they're missing out on in life. And so these are some of the demographics that could actually really benefit from your church developing an entire social media presence and ministry as well. Myth number four is that you can't afford 
to do it that that running a social media ministry running a youtube channel can become very very expensive and the truth is it can be expensive but it doesn't have to be when i first started i started with zero dollars you know i remember starting off in my living room in this apartment that i rented in philadelphia on main street i mean i think i paid like 750 dollars for a rat infested apartment this is my living room i have a hundred dollars uh, it's like literally a hundred dollars of lights from Home Depot, like just investing in the bare minimum in, in far as gear and technology just to get started. And so when people tell me that I can't afford to, I like to say you actually can't afford to not do it. You know, the most recent studies say that somewhere in the range of 59% of uh, people who are raised in the church, when they get to the age of 18, end up leaving the church. 59%. That's crazy. And then I think about the local churches that I've visited around the country, uh, the, the churches that I've been a part of. You know, you look around and the average hair color in most churches is white. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's a good fashion statement. Why not? Um, and there's nothing wrong with old people in the church. Like, that's great. But I want you to think about this in your local church. What happens if 60% of your young people were to leave? And let's say in 20 or 25 years, all the people that are older end up start dying off. What happens to your church? Well, it's what happens to a lot of churches around the country. They literally start to die off. And so if, you're, if we are not reaching young people where they are at, what happens to our church? And so as much as it might be quote unquote expensive to start a ministry, which it's clearly not with my example, but even if it were, you couldn't afford not to because a church can't survive without passing down the message to future generations. And I think, again, social media is one of the major ways that we can actually do this. I remember a board meeting that I went uh, at, at a church in Southern California. I used to run an evangelism program out of Southern California. And we we're presenting this program to a church saying, hey, these are the different things that we're going to do. You'll get this training. You'll get these speakers. You'll get all these different things in this proposal that I had. And here's the cost. And there was some discussion around the cost of this project, much like many people do with digital missions. Oh, it's kind of expensive. Can we afford it? Blah, 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 blah. Someone said on the board meeting, hey, I noticed that last year we spent X thousands of dollars paying to make sure that our grounds were kept, that we were trimming our lawn and making sure that someone was taking care of our grass. And then they suggested, what if we found volunteers to do this instead? What if even, God forbid, we decided to get rid of our grass budget and decided to allocate that money towards missions. And I think that that was a fairly novel concept. I think that was worth considering. But unfortunately, the church board ended up voting it down. Uh, apparently to them, they found money, they found budget for cutting the grass, but they couldn't find budget for missions. And so my point is, is I believe that you can find money for the project that you deem important. I, I believe that for the vast majority of churches that are out there, if you have a compelling vision, if you have a compelling idea of what God has called you to do, you're going to find funding in order to actually do it. Um, and even if you can't, uh, start with what you got. You know, many of us have smartphones today. The, the average smartphone in, in, in the average uh, person's pocket today is so capable of creating great quality videos. Like my iPhone 8 has the ability to shoot 4K video and create some really stunning pictures. If you go on YouTube, you can find entire film contests that are done under the premise of saying it's a, an iPhone only film contest and see some of the coolest like short films and documentaries and mo feature length movies that are done with just a cell phone. Did you know the iPhone 6, which is several generations old, has a 32,600 times faster uh, computing pro uh, processor than the computer that put Apollo on the moon. And so there's no really excuse. Like you can, for a few hundred dollars, get a really great setup. You can actually do quite a bit with just starting with what you have. With, with the advent of social media, Instagram stories, Snapchat, Facebook video, all these different kinds of things, in a certain sense, video quality has never been less important than ever before. All the viral videos, you know, that, that have gone crazy out there, the very, like, vast majority of them don't have high budgets. They don't have professional cameras or lighting or microphones or any of these kinds of things. Most of them were just shot on a cell phone. So there's no excuse. Just get started. And this leads us to myth number five, that you need to have a big team. Obviously, it's going to be better if you have a, a team of people working with you and have a, a group of people that are kind of journeying with, uh, through this all with you as well. But, but this is not really necessary. Like you can get started by yourself. 
um, I actually don't have a team at this present moment. Like I, I don't have a church that's supporting me. I don't have a community of people that are like helping me to create the content. This is just something that I'm doing because I believe in it. I, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier. I actually, uh, when I was teaching um, at the Bible college in Philadelphia, I felt God calling me to do this so much that I actually did what most mis- missionaries do when they're called to become missionaries. I quit my job. And I decided to just throw myself full into the mission because this is something that I really believe in. And so you don't really need a big team. You just need to have the courage to get started to let God use you. In closing, I want to share with you guys a quote from Justin Wise from the social media church that I really appreciate. He says, we've done it that way is more poisonous than ever. Innovation isn't just a virtue. It is a requirement. As we talked about in the beginning of this presentation, uh, industries that don't adapt and that don't change and evolve with the times eventually become extinct. And I think that this is really the risk that the church uh, faces. If we don't adapt and change the way that we do missions uh, and, and really just adapt with the times and evolve this, there's we run a really big risk of, of, uh, of, of failing in our mission as a church. And so I want to really challenge you guys out there. I believe that God is calling and trying to raise up a generation of digital missionaries, of, 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 of people who are taking the, the message of spreading the gospel very seriously, so much so that they're willing to go where people are spending their time. Now, this is what we see again in in Jesus' example. He went where people were. And I believe that if Jesus were here today, that Jesus would actually be using social media. You know, I think about uh, the New Testament heroes, you know, Paul or John or Peter or whatever the case is, you know, just powerful men of God, right? I believe full, like wholeheartedly that they would be using social media to spread their message. And when I think about this, like it makes more and more sense. I think about John on the island of Patmos, right? John, because of his circumstance, wasn't able to go to, say, the Church of Pergamos or Thyatira or Philadelphia. He wasn't able to go and preach there. He was stuck on Patmos. He couldn't go and visit his church members. He couldn't go and give a Bible study, go and knock on people's doors. So what did he do? He decided to get out like a pen and paper and to write a blog post and to send that blog post to the different churches out there. And as a result, you and I now have the Bible in our hands because of the men of God who decided to use the modern social media of that day. So if you were to transplant them into today's day and age, how would they go about spreading the message of a soon coming savior, a soon coming and risen savior? What would they do? Would they only do church on the weekends or do you think they might do what I'm trying to say and they would do digital missions? That's a question I want to leave with you today and I want to invite you. If God is calling you and you really feel impressed with this, I want to challenge you to to, to really throw your full weight behind this. I believe that some of the best ministry that we could possibly do and the best ministry ROI or return on investment really actually comes in the form of digital missions missions. And so if this is something God's calling you to do, I want to challenge you, give it your best. And you'll see that God is in the business of changing lives, whether you're preaching the gospel on a given weekend service or you're preaching the gospel on a YouTube video. And so if you're going to be on YouTube, I hope to see you there soon. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to comment uh, down below or to send me an email over at justin at thatchristianvlogger.com. And I'd love to talk to you soon. But until then, God bless.